Hello everyone and welcome to another very nice game from the 1916 New York Rice Tournament. Uh, Capablanca is without a loss so far, this is round 10 and the only game uh, the Capablanca didn't win was the previous one in round 9, that was a draw. Uh, and here he faces Alfred Schroeder. Uh, I haven't found any information on this gentleman so uh, we are once again honoring the hoodie guy by wearing a hoodie. Uh, I do hope you, you are doing the same as well, uh, you know, to... to you, further uh, enjoy the game uh, but uh, it's really an impressive game and if you remember I think it was last year we've shown a game between Mikael Tal uh, and Honfi Karoli uh, where Tal was, wasn't uh, very pleased that Karoli didn't play the best defense uh, as uh, Tal really prepared a, a really complicated uh, combination and then he couldn't show it in the game uh, because his opponent didn't play the best defense and here it's a, it's a similar game uh, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy it and it's really a, a 15 move line that uh, Capablanca prepared but uh, better better just uh, if I show it to you. And uh, unlike for all the other games that were played in New York in various clubs, uh, in various chess clubs, uh, this one was actually played in Yale University. So if any of you are perhaps studying in Yale University, do know that this game Capablanca vs. Schroeder uh, was played in your university. So without further ado, Capablanca has the white pieces and of course we have D4 on the board. Uh, you don't have to be uh, an expert on this channel to know that we will have the Queen's Gambit decline on the board. We have c4 uh, and knight to f6. We have knight to c3 by Capablanca, knight bd7, bishop to g5, all pretty standard, bishop to e7, both sides just developing, e3, uh, shredder castles, and now rook to c1 by Capablanca. Uh, a6, black is waiting uh, with the capture on c4, he, uh, he's waiting for Capablanca to develop the light square bishop as is, it, it is customary. Uh, queen to c2 and now rook to e8, as black has plenty of useful moves, uh, so he can really just wait for white to develop the light square bishop. Bishop to d3 and of course only now does he capture on c4, bishop captures and now uh, takes... Uh, uh, well, the awkward position of the light square bishop uh, as a means of expanding on the queen side. So b5. Bishop back to d3, still pressuring that h6, uh, h7 pawn. Bishop to b7, black now finally solves the uh, the problem of uh, developing the light square bishop. Uh, and here Capablanca has a couple of moves to choose from. He decides to, to attack the flank on the queen side with a4, inviting black to push forward with b4. And, and here Capablanca can go knight to e4, but first he decides for bishop captures on f6. Uh, and okay, knight captures on f6, we enter a series of trades knight to e4, knight captures, bishop captures, bishop captures, and now queen captures. And here, c5. Uh, a very nice idea by black, a very principled idea. You want to get rid of your backwards pawn, attacking Capablanca's very strong center. Uh, but it is a temporary pawn sacrifice. So Capablanca captures it, we have d captures on c5. And now, uh, you still can't capture back because the rook is defending it, queen to a5. And here Capablanca has to make a choice. Does he go c6 or does he capture on a4? Uh, c6 and allowing black to capture on a4 is one way to do it. Then you have a very strong pass pawn on, uh, on c6, but black will simply move the queen and start pushing his own pass pawn and create a passed a pawn, which will be an outside pass pawn. So it's, uh, you know, it is playable, but Capablanca decides to go for a different idea. After queen to a5, Capablanca plays b3, defends the a4 pawn, and gives up the c5 pawn instead. Uh, bishop captures on c5, and now uh, knight to g5. Capablanca is threatening to capture on h7, and here you can either block with the g6, or you can play what was played in the game, which isn't something everyone would play. Uh, here g6 is the most likely option that most of us would go for and then after queen to e5 uh, just lining up the queen with the white queen uh, with the black queen on a5 black can go here you can trade queens and then play the end game where Capablanca has uh, a knight and his opponent has a bishop but the pawns on, on the queen side are all on light squares so that the bishop uh, would be uh, in somewhat of a, of a disadvantage uh, uh, unlike the knight, it's a, I mean, it's a very strong knight. So here, uh, Shredder decides he does not want to play this endgame against Capablanca, and he actually decides to go for h6. He allows Capablanca to infiltrate with the queen, and he sets uh, what seems to be a very deadly trap for Capablanca. Or does he? But, uh, I mean, he does, but he just doesn't know he doesn't. Uh, here, Capablanca goes for it. Queen to h7 check. 
we have king to f8 and now uh, you should probably go back with the knight, knight to e4 and then everything is perfectly fine for black but Capablanca finds a different idea. He plays queen to h8 with check, we have king to e7 and now both Capablanca's queen and the knight are under attack but Capablanca has everything figured out. Uh, he decides to sacrifice the knight, he plays queen captures on g7, we have h captures on g5, Capablanca gives up a knight and now queen captures on g5 with check. King to d6 and now we have king to e2, getting the king uh, away from a dark square. There's no danger now, but uh, you know, the position could easily open up and then something like bishop captures, uh, you could blunder your queen. I mean, uh, that's not the only reason he does it, he also wants to get his rook into the game. Uh, we have rook 8 to c8, black uh, starts developing his rooks, and rook to c4. A nice rook lift, and uh, here Capablanca is preparing rook h to c1 to double up the other, to double up rooks on the c file. Uh, king to c6, black wants to hide the king all the way uh, over to the queen side. We have rook h to c1, Capablanca now successfully doubles rook on the queen side, uh, and king moves, king to b6. So this was Capablanca's plan. This is what Capablanca saw uh, when he sacrificed the knight on g5. He's up two pawns, but he's down uh, a bishop. Uh, but he does have a passed h pawn, and uh, well, that passed h pawn is a very fast pawn. So what do you do with a passed pawn? Uh, of course, all, all of you know, uh, you simply push it. And here, uh, this is exactly what Capablanca does. He pushes the pawn to h4. Uh, and this is the moment where Capablanca doesn't uh, feel his opponent played the the absolute best defense here his opponent played f5 and this is a move that doesn't do all that much uh, what Capablanca was preparing on what Capablanca showed after the game because he Capablanca was awarded the brilliancy prize for this game uh, and uh, there you have the quote above the board by Bill Hartstone that uh, also me uh, talks about this game what we shouldn't forget is that it takes two very good players to create a brilliant game. I always feel the role of the loser in a brilliancy is underestimated. And uh, Harston also said that he feels that the loser should be awarded the money for the brilliancy prize because the winner is, uh, well, he, he's, he's happy because he played a brilliant game. Uh, so the money should go to the loser. Uh, but regardless, Capablanca showed after the game but rather, I'm just going to show you how the game went on and then I'm going to show you what Capablanca uh, presented after the game. Here uh, we have f5 by Shredder uh, and now comes queen to g7 by Capablanca, preparing to remaneuver the queen to, over to e5. Uh, we have rook to e7, attacking the queen, queen to e5 and now uh, black's last hope was to play something like rook to c7, just uh, guarding the c5 bishop, but then you lose the e6 pawn, and after king moves, uh, you're gonna lose the f5 pawn as well, and here Capablanca would be uh, up four pawns, uh, and four pawns is more than enough compensation for the piece, so this would be winning for white. Uh, but here Capablanca's opponent actually played rook to c6. He said, I'm gonna play rook to c6, then I'm gonna bring the other rook over to c7, so my rook from e6 will be defending the e6 pawn. But it simply doesn't work. Uh, here Capablanca played one move uh, and his opponent resigned the game but uh, feel free to pause the video here and try to figure out what was the move Capablanca played in this position. Uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to decide whether you want to do it as usual while I have a nice sip of my water. For those of you who were able to do it, congratulations, you are uh, once again an excellent uh, finder of moves that uh, haven't didn't happen in the game. And for those of you who w just want to enjoy the show, here Capablanca played Rook Captures on C5, uh, which actually did happen in the game. After Rook Captures on C5, uh, Alfred Treader resigned the game. Uh, because now you see after either you capture with the Queen and then you lose the Queen, or Rook Captures and then comes Queen D6 check, and now uh, you can either grab the rook or just trap the black queen. After rook blocks, you will play rook captures and after king b7, now you go rook c5 and the black queen is trapped, there's nowhere to go. Uh, I mean, you could go to b6, but then you certainly lose the rook. Uh, let's say you go queen b6, then just queen captures on e7, you're up a whole rook, completely winning. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, Mr. Alfred Trader did not wait for this. After uh, this rook to c5, uh, he resigned the game. Uh, after this rook to c5 here.
yeah, after rook captures on c5, he resigned the game. But uh, why I said Capablanca wasn't happy about this position, because here after h4, Capablanca had a completely different idea in mind, one that doesn't allow Cap Capablanca to infiltrate so easily. Here Capablanca presented uh, the following series of moves after the game. Rook to c7. Uh, this is what Capablanca had in mind for black to double up on the c file. Uh, Capablanca would push the pawn to h5, rook e to c8, now black doubles up on the c file as well, h6 by Capablanca, and now bishop to d6. Here black can just trade down and he will be uh, left with a piece in the endgame where white will not have any pieces. And this is what Capablanca had in mind. Queen captures on a5, king captures on a5, rook captures on c7, rook captures, rook captures, bishop captures, and here uh, f4. A very nice move that doesn't allow bishop to, sorry, bishop to e5 to control the queening square, that is the h8 square, uh, but here black can still catch up to the h8 square, just bishop to d8. Now you can go bishop f6, control the h8 square, uh, but Capablanca goes g4, and the pawn storm is just too powerful. Uh, bishop to f6, but now comes g5, bishop h8, and now e4, and the black king is simply too slow. King b6, now comes f5. E captures, pawn captures, the king now uh, tries to catch up to the pawns, but the g6 is coming. F captures, pawn captures, and now there is no defense against g7. King d6, but just g7, uh, the black king is too slow, captures, captures, and if you try to catch up to the pawn, uh, of course you will not be able to do it, white will bring a queen into the game, and white of course is completely winning here. Uh, so this is what Capablanca had in mind, and why he wasn't very happy with this game, even though he did win, but uh, he, he wanted to play this one, and he wouldn't be, uh, I mean... Uh, they wouldn't award the brilliancy prize to him if he, he didn't uh, show this uh, wonderful line after the game finished. Uh, but yeah, uh, and uh, for those of you who are maybe new to this channel, maybe you're not familiar with that game, uh, Honfi Karoli versus Mikal Tal, where Mikal Tal also wasn't happy with the line Karoli played because it ruined his brilliancy, then he also had to present his line after the game. I will put a link to it in the description below, it will be the first thing you will see, so do check it out, it's quite a lovely game. And also I would like to invite everyone to check out an impression video uh, by the Granky Chess Classic video team. Uh, the Granky Chess Classic is starting very soon, so... Uh, you know, we are expecting a lot of high quality footage from every round and this is before the, the main event even started but it's a wonderful impression, it lasts two minutes so do check it out, it will be the second link in the description below. So that's the game, I do hope you enjoyed it and I also have a special announcement for this video, uh, I have a, 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 a birthday wish for Mr. James Snowell, here we have it, his girlfriend sent me this photo, uh, it's him watching one of my videos uh, and as you can see uh, so for some reason, every time someone uh, screenshots or takes a photo of my video, video, I always have this weird expression on my face. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's just the way it is. Uh, I can't help it. Uh, but yeah, uh, I wish you a very happy birthday, Mr. James Snowell. And, you know, uh, I really hope you, you had a great one. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's it for this game. Capablanca still undefeated in the New York Rice Tournament of 1916. Out of 10 games, 9 wins and 1 draw. Next game he faces uh, Borislav Kostic, uh, a legend uh, chess player, but uh, we're going to get back to that. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Lu, Lu Shwekong, uh, Thomas Jager, uh, Andy, uh, Andy Proudfoot, Clinton Fuller, and Tony Moe at Guitar for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing the Capablanca saga, we're preparing for the Grand KHS Classic, and of course, as usual, checking up on your suggestions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your weekend.